Hey everyone, we're back for another Ask a GN episode. And as always, comments in the questions below. <laughs> questions in the comments below. If you have questions, uh, we'll try and address them in the next episode. So this is where we address your questions and sort of a Q&A before getting to the questions this episode. It is brought to you by IY Power and the new Elements Gaming PC with the full side window that is all tempered glass, LEDs, and it's basically a modified S340 case. So uh, first off, before getting to other questions, I wanted to talk about this. This is a unit we just got in. This is a Synology NAS. I think it's a DS1515+. Plus. And so we loaded this up because we've been having some pretty serious data management issues with all of our videos. Uh, to give you an idea, we've been burning through, because of the video, photo, test data, uh, article, image, website management, all that stuff, we've been burning through about 100 gigabytes of data per week. It's unhappy because it's not plugged into an Ethernet cable. Uh, so this is a NAS, and speaking of Ethernet cables, that is how it works. It's got, I think, four ports on this particular model. So it can plug into Ethernet, and basically we pipe, yes, four ports. So we pipe that in to our local gigabit switch. We just use sort of a generic gigabit switch, have a couple of them for the different test setups, and then all the data can feed through to all the PCs. So the cool thing is that I wanted to talk about with this is we've now set up our multiple test benches, the laptops that are under test, the uh, production systems, the render machine, all that stuff talks to this. It's all separated. I've even started doing permissions and things like that so that uh, users who are only accessing testing data only see that data to reduce confusion. So it's helping a lot. Give you an idea of what this is. It's a 20 terabyte setup. We've got it in RAID with all of these populated, so five disks. Uh, they are Seagate disks. I'm not sure how their NAS disks perform yet. This is the first time I've used them. I've not had great luck with some Seagate stuff in the past, but th so far it seems okay. And it is in RAID. I've got it set up in a RAID 5 setup, so that means one disk is effectively a parity disk. Uh, so if we have one failure, pull it out, put another one in, and then we'll, we'll be good to go. Um, so that's the, the sort of what we've been working on lately. Cool technology. I've had a lot of fun with the back end managing it. We obviously don't really sort of review this stuff generally, but I will probably be publishing some test data on it just to show the improvement from our existing three disk RAID 5 setup on the local render machine to the five disk RAID 5 setup with complete remote access. Uh, it's got a web interface, so pretty cool stuff. But that is the NAS we've been using. So that's what you're seeing all the videos on because we're burning, again, almost half a terabyte per month in video content, thanks to the high demand for video content. So thank you for watching. Uh, questions. First one is from Spork8655, who says, hey, Steve, I understand that there's no way of knowing this for sure, but how long do you estimate Sandy Bridge CPUs like the 3960X, that was a good CPU, 3930K, 2700K, 2600K, uh, so we've got Sandy Bridge E and Sandy Bridge. How long do you think they'll be relevant for high-end gaming PCs, uh, particularly calling out a GTX 1080? So y you are correct. I do not have a good way of knowing 100% for sure, but uh, I do know that some of these CVs you've li listed, like the 3960X especially, it's still perfectly fine. That's a good chip. It was an extreme series chip. 3930K, also a good chip. 2600 definitely is getting a bit aged, I'm sure it's long in the tooth for some more CPU bound games, but you do need to run into those games obviously to really experience an issue. The interesting thing is with new APIs, they're not, they're not really hitting the market as quickly as you would want for Sandy Bridge, but going forward, uh, the new APIs will aid those older CPUs in terms of managing load. So uh, as we've discussed before, as many of you all know at this point, draw call is obviously the sort of one really go-to that everyone talks about. The draw calls are being moved more heavily to GPUs. They don't have to uh, sort of correspond with the CPU for every single draw call anymore with DX12 and Vulkan, if the game is built ground up for those APIs. Otherwise, it's just a wrapper and it has to do all the work plus the wrapped overhead. But so that's one point that works for you for these older CPUs. That's a good thing. In terms of the, the sort of more realistic immediate future and present where we're still on DX11 for almost everything, and in some very rare cases, OpenGL, 
you will definitely start seeing limitations in a few CPU-bound games. One example, Total War Warhammer. It's not a GPU-bound game. So if you throw a GTX 1080 in there with a 2600K, you will definitely see throttling versus something like a 6700K. That's fact. Now, how much throttling will it be relevant to you? It depends uh, sort of on what settings you demand, what the rest of your setup is in terms of uh, graphics options, resolution of the monitor, multi-monitor, all that stuff. But a lot of the, the options for those types of games will impact the CPU heavily, and that is something we see with Total War, but it's DX12 enabled, at least for testing. So uh, that is a positive as well. So uh, the hard answer, no, I do not know. If I had to estimate, this is a wide range of CPUs, the 3960X, if I had it in my system, I would still personally be using it because that's perfectly fine, even for rendering tasks, if you're not doing it every single day. A 2600K, let's look at that one. That was a really popular CPU and will definitely age out the fastest. But I mean, I, I probably wouldn't want to pair it with a 1080, but if you're in a situation where you want to buy a 1080 today or whatever equivalent card and then upgrade CPUs, maybe with KB Lake, uh, I would be okay with that. I probably wouldn't want to pair it with a 2600K for a long term though, uh, just because it, it does definitely impact performance in some CPU games. But it depends on the games you're playing. So that's sort of the, the long answer to that. I know it's not the uh, direct answer. We really can't give you one because obviously I only have so much future sight. Next question is from Very Real Americans who says, Hi Gamers Nexus, love the channel, thank you. Quick question, I'm upgrading from my 2600K, okay, so we've got another one, to a 6700K. This means I need to get a new motherboard. That is correct. Am I good just plugging in my old SSD with all my stuff on it to my new board and boot to the same OS? Do I need a complete new install? Depends on your OS. Uh, Linux is very friendly with switching operating systems generally in my experience. Ubuntu, I've never really had, I said switching operating systems, I meant switching platforms. Ubuntu, I've never had an issue say moving from uh, an AMD system to an Intel system. Windows, I've had lots of issues and many other people have too. So with Windows, uh, depending on what you're using, some Windows versions will attach themselves to uh, like CPU, motherboard platform, things like that. In those instances, it will be very unhappy with a move. Older versions of Windows especially, Windows 7 has had issues. I know Windows 8 has had some issues. Those older versions, especially as you migrate from very different architectures, one to the next, that is when you'll see the biggest impact. Uh, and it, it could be a few things. It could be you know immediately because you blue screen can't boot or it says no operating system detected or something like that. So that's obviously a failure. You can't work around that. Uh, another potential issue, well, you could try to work around it, but it's really not worth it. Another potential issue is uh, it looks like it works, but there's some performance loss because who knows what's going on under the hood. And the, one of the reasons for a lot of that stuff is because you've got all these old drivers that are just embedded in the system, uh, chipset drivers, all the graphics audio, all that stuff. And it's more than that too because every single USB device you've ever used goes into the system and is logged somewhere. Uh, every you know, GPU, RAM, CPU, all that stuff, it knows what all those devices are. Windows builds itself around talking to them, especially older versions. So it doesn't do well with migration. You can certainly clean it up, but uh, unless you very much need to keep that OS, I would recommend a clean install and just in the future partition everything in a way that you can keep all your documents, images, all that stuff isolated and just blast the OS whenever you need to change it. Windows 10, I've had pretty good luck with changing, but again, when you change platforms, you definitely can see some variance and even frame rate moving from one platform to the next. Uh, you really need to be thorough with driver cleaning, but uh, it, it does depend on the OS. Next question is, oh, well, I guess to sort of directly answer, 2600K to 6700K, try it. If it looks like it's performing poorly, uh, before maybe the migration, before you migrate, try and uh, do a quick benchmark so you know your baseline. Test it again with the new platform. If it looks bad, it's not booting, then just be prepared to wipe it. Uh, next question is from Oberst, Oberst uh, who says, do you know what's an acceptable max temperature for VRMs? If you're talking about motherboard VRMs, well, any VRM, it depends, as always, on the components, the MOSFETs, 
everything they use in their cooling. But generally, they can get pretty damn hot, so they, they have a much greater range of temperature tolerance than something like a GPU or a CPU, where you might kind of hit limits at 90C. With most VRMs, most, very blanket there, uh, you'll be okay 100 degrees plus. What's acceptable is maybe different from what's the max. The max, some VRMs we've worked with recently can go up to 125C. Would you want to do that? Absolutely not. Uh, but they will still function. They lose efficiency as they heat up, of course. And obviously, they can heat up neighboring components, which you don't necessarily want. But uh, you can definitely go up there. So if you see 100 degrees C, I would try to do something to work on that, maybe another fan or something if it's a motherboard uh, setup. Or if you have top exhaust, get rid of that. Because in a lot of cases, not all, but a lot of cases, we've found that's bad for VRM and for CPU cooling if you're using a tower cooler. Try and do something about it, but 100C for a VRM is not something that it can't handle. Probably don't want to run it long term, 24 7 uptimes, but it's not uh, something that the system can't tolerate. Otherwise, it would turn itself off. But so that's just kind of an overview of that. If you want more information on VRM temperature, I am certainly not afraid to point you toward absolutely or apps, it, it actually hardcore overclocking. Sorry. Ahawk, I have screwed up your name like four times in a row. Actually, Hardcore Overclocking is the channel. Search it on YouTube. He does a lot of in-depth stuff with that, uh, and that'll answer some of those questions very specifically for specific video cards. Next question, Big Man 700 says, I have a possibly dumb question. What is the highest temperature Celsius that you would want your CPU to run when under 100% load? Definitely not a, a dumb question. So the highest temperature Celsius you would want to run uh, when under 100% load it depends a bit on the CPU, but generally they are all kind of uh, TJ Maxx, about 100C, about plus minus five normally. Some, some are lower, like non-K CPUs are a lot lower. But generally, that's kind of the max of your average K SKU CPU from Intel or AMD even. And that's the temperature at which there will be a thermal shutdown if it can't throttle itself to control the temperatures. So what happens is as you approach that maximum, the CPU will start backing off of the clock rate and comets frequency and try and lower temperatures. Uh, so in those instances, you'll see frame rate output drop. The average output over time will drop. But it's because it's trying to control the temperature. So you do have protections there. But in terms of the, the maximum, you would definitely want to stay ideally under a point where the CPU is throttling because you obviously don't want to lose performance for a reason as kind of dumb as heat uh, as opposed to like a, a hardware reason or voltage reason. But for, for my CPUs, if I'm running air and we're just talking actual diode temperature value, not a delta value, I would probably be looking at, I try to keep them less than 80. That's not always possible. It does depend if it's an FX9000 series CPU, that's a lot harder. If it's an extreme series Intel CPU, Broadwell E, that's a lot harder because they are higher wattage chips, so they generate a lot more heat. But that's kind of where I like to stick around is ADC for air if I can do it. If I'm on liquid, it depends a lot on the cooler, the sort of cheap 550LC ASTEC coolers, 120 millimeter coolers, they really can't do a lot for extreme series chips. We, on our render rig, hit 70 something Celsius. That's with liquid. Uh, that's not ideal. I will be replacing that soon with a better radiator and cooler. But with liquid, I, I would like to target sort of the 50s Celsius uh, non-delta value. So hopefully that kind of answers that question. That is very general. That is all my personal preference. So your mileage may vary, but that's kind of what I look for when I'm fine tuning my systems. If you can get it lower, great, but it is hard because 100% load generates a lot of heat uh, for any modern CPU for the most part. Next question, last question is from Talmios who says, CPU cooler orientation is horizontal parallel with the GPU worse for thermals than the usual vertical positioning. I have case fans both at the top and the back. Uh, so this is another depends. I'll give you a few scenarios where, where things do matter. We've tested this with the Manta and with the 400C, where fans are in different positions in the case. And uh, those, those are just the recent ones. I've also done the Kabai KLO4, KLO5. We've done the Half X ages ago. Lots of cases. Generally, with a fan in the top, 
and even ignoring the CPU cooler orientation, the fan at the top has exhaust, you do potentially eat air away, almost like you're suffocating the CPU fan. You're pulling air away from that fan, depending on where it's positioned. Uh, so in some cases, like the KL04, I've actually seen improved performance by doing intake in the top, which is not something you sort of normally think about. Not ideal for dust management, but better performance or no fans on the top, and I've gotten better performance. That's not true for every case. There are certainly cases where it's better to have top exhaust. It depends on how they're built, the air channels, your tower cooler you're using, all that stuff matters. But uh, the question here specifically, parallel with the GPU mounting, so that's where you've got, I, I guess you're asking, video cards like this slotted into the case, and then you've got a cooler here, and the air is going that way out the back. In that scenario, no, it is not worse for thermals generally, but that's mainly because your alternative is to turn, to rotate it and point it down at the GPU. So either you're pulling air in the top of the cooler and pushing it down through into the back of the card, which will heat up the card, uh, potentially not in a way that matters, but it depends how hot your CPU is, or you're trying to pull air in and up and out the top, which now your thermals will be pretty bad because You've got the card restricting your air th airflow through a tiny channel, and the back of the card generates heat, by the way, and we've measured this in tests with the Manta and the 400C. Uh, the card generates heat. It'll radiate maybe one or two degrees, not a lot, but it'll certainly radiate heat and warm up your CPU temperature because you are losing dissipation ability of the rest of the CPU heat sink because you, you're just sucking in warmer air. Um, so I would position it the way that you're saying. I would position it to shoot out the back if it's a tower cooler, not position it towards the GPU if avoidable. But uh, as far as fan orientation, do as much intake in the front and bottom as you can. Uh, side intake is great for GPU temperatures. Not every case does it. And I would avoid doing too complex a setup in the top of your average case, depending on your case, because that is where it starts starts getting fuzzy as to if there's an actual benefit or if it's even hindering the cooling. So that is all for this episode. As always, Patreon link to the post video. Leave comments below with questions for the next episode. And uh, subscribe for more. I'll see you all next time.